Friends, you may stay standing for the reading of God's word. Our launching passage is going to be in 1 Samuel this morning. 1 Samuel 15, 10 through 11, and then I'm going to skip down to verses 24 through 29. The word of the Lord came to Samuel. I regret that I have made Saul king, for he has turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. And Samuel was angry, and he cried to the Lord all night. Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord in your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may bow before the Lord. And Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. As Samuel turned to go away, Saul seized the skirt of his robe, and it tore. And Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. And also, the glory of Israel will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should have regret. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, good morning once again, church. If you haven't met me before, my name is Zach Graves. I'm one of the pastors who serves alongside Pastor Michael with students, junior high and high school and then supporting Doxa Kids as well. It is my joy to be with you this morning, and we are continuing our study through God's godness. What makes God God? His attributes, something that we as humans, we have to define individually. We put these things in categories. They are seemingly in separate categories for us, and this is us as finite human beings describing what is really one true perfection of God, God himself, his essence, so infinite and so grand that for us who are finite humans, we have to describe it in different facets. I have the privilege of continuing our series today, and I I wrote in my notes originally how I hoped that this would not be so much of a new concept to you, but more so a continuation of last week. How many of us wish that we could just kind of hit pause? Do you need it last week one more time to fully understand it? I think most of us are like, yeah, we're just about there. Even those of us that understand the concept are like, we want to sit in it more. And as I was like, okay, cool, this is great. This is more so a emphasis on what was last week. But as I sit on these notes this week, I say, no, this really also is a radically new thing for many of us in this room. If last week we focused on how God does not change... He's immutable. That is indeed absolutely true. He does not change. And therefore, God is not acted upon by anything, anything within himself as component parts or anything in creation. He instead is impassable. And that's the title for this morning, divine impassibility, divine impassibility. I'm going to do what Michael did two weeks ago. By show of hands, how many of you have even heard of divine impassibility before? Raise them high so I can see you. Okay. I don't know how many Pastor Michael had. I think I've got like three or four. It's kind of what I anticipated. Okay, friends, uh, simplicity was all these attributes. They're, They're difficult for us, right? God is grander than us. But simplicity is more so connecting the dots in some logical concepts, and also some scripture verses that we have. Deuteronomy 6, the Lord our God, our Lord is one. Okay, sweet, awesome, one, simple, no parts. Still hard to wrap our mind around, but we're connecting dots that have already been laid out for us. When we talk about divine impassibility, these dots are things you have already connected, perhaps in incorrect ways. And now we're having to redo this work together. This is a hard thing to wrap our minds around, but, 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 this is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly life-giving for us to sit in. This is for our benefit, to see who God truly is. So let's start, before we even get to a big idea, with some definitions. I think it's going to be really helpful. What is impassibility? Our first definition. Impassibility means that God does not experience emotional changes, either from within 
or affected, brought about by his relationship to creation. God has no passions. So if you're looking for your simple definition, just like how simplicity was God has no parts, immutability, God does not change, aseity, God is self-caused, impassibility, God has no passions. Now, when I say passions, you typically will think through what we describe as passions, right? We have, we have things called crimes of passion. So like passion is often associated with love. We often ask people what they're enthused by and relate it to passions. I do that all the time. One of my favorite questions to ask people is what are you passionate about? Because I want to know what people are moved by internally. And that is connected to, but not ultimately what we mean by passions. No, our definition for passions comes from a Latin word meaning to suffer, submit, undergo, experience, and endure. Passions have been classically used to describe not only what you physically suffer, but also emotional changes in humans. We as humans sense a perceived good. We think something is good, or, or we immediately desire it, or maybe we define something else as good, and so we are repulsed by it, we push away. And when that happens, that is the passions at work. And we see this at different levels, right? So if I was to describe to you a In-N-Out burger, oh, just an animal-style cheeseburger, sautéed onions and whole dill pickle chips, because that's why you go animal-style, with cheese, fresh crisp lettuce, sliced tomato, on a bun that is toasted to perfection with special sauce and a juicy grilled beef patty. I just drooled a little bit while I said that. <laughs> As I describe that to you, you begin to desire it. That is the passions at work. Maybe not all of you, universally. Uh, the 11 a.m. service is going to be really wrecked by that example because they're right next to lunchtime. That is the passions at work. And here's what's going on. A passable creature, you and I, we undergo change. We are acted upon by our passions. We go from one state of being to the next. You weren't hungry. Now you are hungry. You were content. Now you're filled with desire. In different examples, you move from being calm to anxious, from peaceful to angry. The examples could go on. And even if you always made the better adjustment, you went from anxious to content, you went from angry to being calm, either way you are undergoing change. You are suffering or enduring some sort of experience that is put upon you, both by component parts within you and also the world around you affecting you. Interestingly enough, when we talk about emotions, even with like our common English language, our English language actually retains much of the suffering experiential terminology that is connected to passions. Uh, think about these words. You can become irritated, exasperated, distressed, troubled, ached. Do we see the pain language and all those? How about with love? You are smitten by someone who is your crush and you fall in love. We, we detecting that? Like our emotional language retains the passion, suffering, enduring concept that it's built off of. And you need to hear me with this. Passions are not inherently sinful. We've described many passions in that last example. Actually, you should become angry at things that deserve Anger. So anger also can be a proper, orderly passion. They're not inherently sinful. That's not the issues. It's that when passions are stoked, there's something outside of us that causes a reaction within us that is not self-caused, and these parts are bodily parts. In other words, they are creaturely. Passions are creaturely, and your God is no creature. He is creator not creature. God is self-caused. He has life in himself. That's a seity. He has no component parts, no bodily parts with a soul that then enact these passions. He is simple. He does not change. He's immutable. And therefore, there are no passions in God's divinity. 
One of the resources that I put on the resource page for us is a short, it's like exactly 100 pages. It's a great book, um, God Without Passions, A Primer to Impassibility. It's by Samuel Renahan. I'm going to quote him here. Renahan says, Passions and affections are motions of the soul worked out through the body relative to perceived good or evil. God does not have a soul. He does not have a body nor faculties that belong to them. He does not perceive or interpret anything, and he does not react to anything. He cannot be acted upon. He cannot be changed or become anything more or less than what he is. Rather, God is all that he is, a most pure spirit. He is simple, essential, actual, and perfect. That is who your God is. And so with these definitions, let's get to the big idea. The big idea is this. God does not have any passions and he cannot suffer. Instead of passions, he has perfections, that being himself. And these perfections assure us his love, his mercy, his justice, and all of the attributes that we would ascribe to him. This is good news. Now, with this big idea, I think it's important for me to give a disclaimer here. The disclaimer is that since we are messing with dots that you've already connected before, maybe I've read the Bible and you've been like, God's got emotions, or maybe this idea of passions being connected to emotions is foreign to you, what's going to happen is that your brain is going to jump to all sorts of thoughts that you have. Because you're curious, you're trying to figure these things out. And so you're like, well, but I know these Bible verses, and what does that mean about me? Like, as a human, I have passions. We all do. We will forever have passions. What does that mean for us? Your brain is going to want to jump to a bunch of different conclusions. Please, please, please stick with me today. There are Sundays and hours of study that you can do at another time to see what is connected to this concept, but this is our focus today. God is perfect, essential, actual, no passions, perfections instead, and this assures us his attributes. This is our focus for today. My prayer for you all this morning is that you would see God as the firm foundation for your salvation. God does not have affections that are stirred up within him. Instead, they are perfect presence of his being. He has set upon us the perfection of who he is in Christ Jesus. Therefore, nothing can remove you from the love of God. That's what we're focused on today. And so to help us kind of bring this into our minds a little bit more, let's start first with the logic of this. I think this is important to do first because we just had to do the hard work of the definitions. Let's see the logical connection before we see how it's present in scripture. So the logic of this, first, we need to understand that we are simply watching logical dominoes fall throughout all this series. We started first with the seity. God is self-existent. He is being. He causes, he is self-caused. Therefore, he has no lack. He is perfect. So therefore, he doesn't have parts. He's simple. He is all that he is. There's no components that lack anything of his being. There's nothing that starts and stops inside God. God is all that he is, no parts. Therefore, he is unchangeable. He's immutable. And therefore, if he's unchangeable, he cannot suffer passions from parts within himself, nor can he be affected by creation outside of himself. This is what we're doing, just seeing logical conclusions as we go from a seity down the line. Secondly, as we reflect on what a passion is, what an emotion is, we see that emotional states of being or any physical suffering that we endure, it it involves a few things logically. First, an emotion or passion, it's, it's finite. It has a start point and an end point. Secondly, it's dependence. It's not self-caused. There's parts within us that are the seat of the passions, and these things are stoked by things that are outside of us. Third, they're time-bound. You 
weren't angry, now you're angry. You weren't hungry, now you're hungry. You were anxious, now you're peaceful. They're time bound. They're tied to specific moments in the space-time continuum. And they're mutable states of being. You are changing. You are undergoing some accident that is put upon you. And so if that is true, if that's what a passion or emotion is, then we realize that God cannot be those things because God is infinite, independent, timeless, and immutable. He is the opposite of finite, dependent, time-bound, and changeable. God is entirely different. So that's our logical foundation. We see that these things come from the description, rightly so, of who God is, but also passions cannot be tied to God because they're entirely creaturely. They're built in time. They're dependent. They change beings into different types of beings within themselves. It is not God. So with that logic, let's then see it in Scripture. And we've got quite a few passages for you to focus on today. First, in that top line that we have are all the verses that came out of last week from Pastor Chris's message. Those verses on immutability that God does not change, they showcase then. Okay, well, if God does not change, then he doesn't change in emotional states. He is constant. That second line there we get to is logical connections for us. John 4, 24 says God is spirit. And if God is spirit, then he has no sense appetites that are within the body. He has no seat of the passions. He is not finite. He's not dependent. He's not time-bound. He is pure, actual spirit. Acts 4.15, this is when Paul and Barnabas are in Lystra, and the Lyconians are seeing Paul and Barnabas, and they're like, okay, they're teaching us some good stuff here. This is beyond us, and you know what? Uh, Barnabas isn't saying anything, so he's got to be Zeus, and Paul is the messenger, so he's Hermes, and then they start to worship them, and like the priest starts to bring out cattle in order to sacrifice to them, and Paul is properly speaking very impassioned. He is distraught at what the Lyconians are doing, and so he pleads with them, do not worship us. We also are men of like passions with you all. Now, your translation may say of a like nature. The Greek word is same passions. It is connected to the word. Paul is saying, don't worship us. We're not infinite. We're not God. We're finite. And how do we see this? We are impassioned, just like you all are. We are like you. We are just men. Exodus 3, 13 through 14 is the statement of God, God's name his being, his self-actualization, his aseity. And so therefore that connects us to the fact that he is self-caused, nothing else, his component parts, causes things within him. He's not affected by creation. As we move into the third line that's on this slide, we get verses that showcase what would seem to be human affections, but they are instead described as perfections of who God is. Romans 9, 15 For he says to Moses, this is God, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Compassion is not stoked within him. It is the perfection of his being, and he places it properly upon his creation. Ephesians 1, 3 through 6, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. God's will always effectively doing exactly what is his being. He is not stoked by anything else. His love is not built up within him. It is himself. Hence why John would say in 1 John, in this is love, not that we've loved God, not that we have stirred him to emotion, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Or rather, more commonly known in verse 16, 
of chapter four, God is love. He does not have love. He is love. It is his essence, the perfection of his being, not an emotion, and it does not change. Lastly, that final line that's on there, we get to verses that seemingly kind of pop out of nowhere, but they begin to affirm this doctrine. Job 35, 5 through 7. This is Elihu reminding Job of the grandness of who God is. And Elihu says, look at the heavens and see and behold the clouds which are higher than you. If you have sinned, what do you accomplish against him? And if your transgressions are multiplied, what do you do to him? If you are righteous, what do you give him? Or what does he receive from your hand? Rhetorical. The answer is nothing. God receives nothing from us. Our sin and our transgressions, they don't harm him. They don't bring about passions that affect him. And should we do good, that doesn't gift him anything. Paul would say in the New Testament, who could bring a gift to him? who has all, who is all in all. Nothing changes God. And then we have our opening passage that's referenced on the screen. 1 Samuel 15. And man, that one's a doozy, right? Like it may have made your head turn kind of just to like a slight 40-ish degree angle as you saw this contrast. Verse 10, God says, I regret that I have made Saul king. And verse 29 says that God will not lie or have regret, for he is not a man that he should have regret. I chose this passage to be our foundation because uh, it's a beautiful foundation for this concept. When we see God's impassibility, we need to know two things. First of all, that God does not have passions. We see that in the latter part of 1 Samuel 15. God will not lie or have regrets. No passions, no emotions. But then secondly, it showcases for us that although God is a different classification of being, he's not an impassioned human. He's not an impassioned superhuman. He's completely separate. That does not make him calloused, cold, static, or inert. God doesn't lack any life. And in fact, there's something about God's being that the human word regret in verse 10 of 1 Samuel 15 helps us analogically get at. It showcases for us something in the being and mind of God that we cannot wholly wrap our minds around, but it's there to show us that he is indeed full of life. I think this is a good moment for us to reflect on the fact that the Bible does not worry about talking in ways that are completely analogical, ways that are not the thing itself. They're connected to the thing. They represent a truth, but they're not the thing itself. And truly, us as humans, we only will ever know God analogically. We will never be able to comprehend the infinite vastness of who God is. And so you should not worry about talking about God the way the Bible talks about God where the Bible will say that the Lord said, I regret that I've made Saul king. Or we will say that God has an arm that is strong to save, even though he has no body and parts, he has no arm. We can speak poetically, analogically, do anthropomorphisms in order to showcase something that is true in God. God condescends, he lowers for us to be able to understand him. He must do that for finite beings. And so when we see 1 Samuel 15 on display, we see that he has no passions, but also he is showing us something that showcases his heart towards creation. And this gets us to our third component here. Impassibility does not equal apathy. Now the the language nerds in the house might be, a little bit upset with me because technically apathy comes from a Greek word that means no passions, a pathos. So I realize we're kind of twisting the language here, but when we understand apathy, most of us in this room, we think of somebody who is calloused, 
cold, indifferent, removed, doesn't care. That's the seed of what apathy means. And the point that I'm trying to make is God not having passions does not make him lifeless. In fact, Matthew Barrett, in one of the resources recommended to you, none greater, he likes to use the word maximally alive. That's who God is. He is maximally alive. God is pure act. He doesn't have a potentiality he's trying to grow into. He is what he is. He has nothing to fulfill, nothing that he needs to become. Therefore, he cannot become more dynamic. He actually is the definition for dynamism. He is maximally alive. God couldn't become more loving, more just, more merciful, more good, because this is the perfection of his being. Ranahan says, we as humans are merciful because we suffer and feel alongside of another person. We enter into their state and we pity them. We're overcome by sympathy or compassion. It is not so with God. But rather than making God uncaring, God, without the passion of mercy, without the heart of misery of human feeling, is the God who helps the helpless. He is the one who helps those who can give absolutely nothing back to him, who do not deserve his help. He alone is truly merciful. This is your God. He is the best definition of mercy. Friends, because God doesn't have passions, he instead has perfections. These perfections, they're not separate from him. They're not parts of him. Remember simplicity. They are him. Therefore, everything that describes God's essence is true of his perfections. Love, mercy, justice, patience, holiness, they are perfect, timeless, eternal, and unchangeable. Do you see how this is good news? God's love for you in Jesus is perfect, timeless, eternal, unchangeable. God's ability to grant grant mercy and grace and to enter into your context is perfect, timeless, eternal, and unchangeable. And yes, for those of you who are not saved in the room, this means that God's love in action against sin, otherwise known as his wrath, it is perfect, timeless, unchangeable, and eternal. It is a fearful thing to be under the hand of God. Our God is perfect, and the joy of seeing God's impassibility, especially if you're in that spot, if you do not trust in Jesus, and therefore God's wrath is perfectly, eternally set against you, We need to have that God who is impassable turn that wrath away from us and onto himself, ultimately, we'll see that later, in order for us to be redeemed. You need an impassable God to save you. I think we as humans, we often want fellow humans that can commiserate with us in our pain. We want someone who feels what we feel. But when we truly need saving, we recognize that we don't need somebody who's in our context. We need somebody who is removed from our context, but knows exactly what we need perfectly and can therefore enter in and save. Matthew Barrett, in that None Greater book, he gives an analogy in the impassibility chapter of a fireman. The scenario being that your house is on fire, your family members are trapped inside, and what you don't want in that minute is your neighbors who they want to show their passions, they want to commiserate with you, and so there's the neighbor who who pulls out their hair and tears their clothes in agony. They're distraught the same way that you're distraught. You don't need somebody who wants to empathize with you and your family, so they throw themselves into the fire to feel the flames that you have felt in your family member feels. No, you need the firefighter who refuses to be overwhelmed by any passion, but with will and intent sets and fixes his mind on the goal to save, jumps into the flames, retrieves your family members, and saves you from your context. This is who God is. 
albeit an imperfect analogy, because all analogies are, they're analogical, but it still showcases us something that's true in God. We don't need someone who screams. We don't need somebody who just wants to suffer alongside of us. We need someone who can enter in perfectly. Friends, before we even get to the application section, this is an application for you. There are many of you who are suffering in this room. There are many of you who are suffering not in this room, and that's why you watch via the live stream. Suffering has inhibited you from being able to be present with us today, this day. Friends, we all endure suffering of some kind, and you have a God who is perfect, whose love is constantly in action, whether it be for your favor for those who are in Christ or to do justice against that which is evil. Your God knows exactly what to do. He enters in regardless of how dark the context might seem. We all have endured a very dark context somewhat recently. That dark context being March of 2020. COVID. On March 29th, Time Magazine published an article that was written by N.T. Wright. The title of the article was, Christianity Offers No Answers to the Coronavirus. It's Not Supposed to. And in the article, Wright writes about, he plays up a passability of God. The intent was, I believe, honest and true, desiring to showcase that God is with us, but it played up too much this passability, saying that God suffers alongside of us. Two days later, on March 31st, the Gospel Coalition wrote an article titled, Only the Impassable God Can Save Us Now. And man, that article is a banger. It is fantastic. In fact, I'm going to read an excerpt from it. It says this, We want a God whose love is so perfect and pure that John can say God is love. We do not want a God who can love more or less. We want a God whose perfect love for us never falters or changes despite the darkest of days. If God could suffer pains of the body, he would be no God. He would be a human. If God could get angry due to hunger, then he's a creature. If God's mood changes on the basis of weather, hormones, or heat, then his love does not outpour upon us with constancy. If God could suffer the pain of loss, his love could be an act of protection to avoid loss. But God loves freely without any need to protect himself. He is open and never closing. If God could lose what he has, what hope do you have that he wouldn't lose you? Do you see what's at stake here? Like if God is passable, if he shifts and he changes, if he loses parts of who, what he has, then logically he therefore could lose you. But because God is perfect and he is eternal, and he is timeless, and he is love, and he is mercy, and he is justice, and he is strength, and he is maximally alive. He withholds you with his strength. If God has passions, he's logically not God. He can shift in his disposition. He could suffer harm and become weak, and he could be hindered from keeping his promises, but that is not who your God is. Praise God that we are cared for by him, the one who is impassable, the one who's supremely focused on what we need in himself, the one who is maximally alive. And because he's maximally alive, he does not shift in disposition. He doesn't become more or less than what he is. He's not compulsive. He's not anxious. He's not lonely. He's not at odds with himself. He is his perfections for forever and ever. This is your God. And so as we see the analogical language in scripture talking about things that look like God's emotions, we should be quick to connect what we think is an emotion to instead God's actions. God's actions constantly being done in his perfect being. This is especially important for things like uh, jealousy. Exodus 34, 14, God's name is jealous. Now, truly jealousy, when we define it, jealousy is zeal for what is yours. So like God owns everything. So everything is God's. So he properly has jealousy. We often do not properly have jealousy. We actually have something called envy. We think something is ours, but it's not. 
and we have zeal for it. That's, that's the, a different thing. But God's jealousy is perfect, and it is not ultimately an emotion. It is his love, his justice, his truth, his beauty in action against that which is attempting to diminish God's goodness in the world. That is who God is. You can trust that the simple God, who is life and goodness, is doing perfectly what is needed in his being. Augustine says it this way, you love God without burning. You are jealous in a way that is free of anxiety. You repent without the pain of regret. You are wrathful and remain tranquil. This is our God. And so we move to our fourth segment, Jesus. Jesus in his incarnation as the God who suffers. We just treaded so much theological, logical, scriptural territory to prove to you that God does not suffer. And now we throw this monkey wrench into the midst. But this is no monkey wrench. No, this is the plan of redemption. And actually, it's also a proof for God's impassibility. The scriptures showcase over and over again, ever since Genesis, that in order for humanity to be saved, there must be a truly obedient human to fulfill the law of God, and also there must be someone who suffers the sting of death, overcoming evil and taking on the just wrath of God that has been outpoured against evil and sin. If God is perfect and righteous, he must do those two things. This must be so. If God doesn't require perfect obedience, then he's allowing some evil to exist in his good creation. And if there isn't someone who can bear the punishment of God's wrath, then justice has been distorted, but God is just. Therefore, these two things must stand. God must offer mercy by someone receiving our punishment, and God must have someone who is obediently instilling the goodness that he is required of creation. So here's the solution. God, who is perfect, who is infinite, who is the definition of goodness, he must be obedient on our behalf. Because humans falter and fail. We cannot do this mission. The problem being that God cannot suffer. So if God can't suffer, if he cannot take on that punishment and suffer that penalty, then we need something to happen. Hence, the incarnation of Jesus. If God was passable, if he could suffer, then there would be no incarnation. But because God is impassable, because he cannot endure passions, then the incarnation must take place so that God can endure passions and prevail. Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, is fully God. He lacks no divinity. And in the incarnation, the person of the son assumes a human nature so that he is now fully God and fully man, the hypostatic union. And now this one person, Jesus, when he acts, he does so always in accordance with those two natures, his divine nature and his human nature. They're not mixed and turned into a different third thing. They're not confused. They're distinct. And in their distinction, They are united in Jesus, his person, so that Jesus can now suffer according to his humanity, but he can hold all things together and do perfectly according to his divinity. The human nature does what is human. It suffers, it sweats, it bleeds, it dies, and the divine nature stamps all of those actions with infinite value and worth. Michael referenced it two weeks ago, but our catechism parents, they know the answer to this because our questions recently have been, what sort of redeemer do we need? One who is truly human and also truly God. Why must the redeemer be truly human? So that he would be obedient on our behalf and suffer the penalty and punishment of death. Why must he be divine? So that his obedience and his suffering would be perfect and effective, lacking in nothing. This is what we have in Jesus, the God-man, the God who does suffer on our behalf. 
Jesus could not bear our sin unless he was human, and he could not conquer sin unless he was God. And truly, he is both. You need the impassable God who has taken on a passable nature, assumed a passable nature in Jesus Christ and has endured those passions and prevailed. This is who your God is. Would you humble yourself to see how great God is, mind-blowing that he is beyond you and yet condescends and takes on, assumes a human nature so that way he'd enter into our context and accomplish what we could not accomplish for ourselves. This God, Jesus, will forever be the God who is fully God and fully man. Right now, on the throne of God, there is a truly human one, Jesus Christ the God-man, who rules and reigns perfectly. We're given no indication in anywhere in Scripture that God will shed his humanity. He retains it forever. And that humanity bears scars for you. That human nature has holes in his hands, wrists, and feet. While your scars spiritually and physically, they will be healed by Jesus. Jesus will retain his scars as a demonstration of his ability to heal yours. His love, perfect and powerful, on display in himself. This is your God. So what's our application? Where are we getting at with all this? Well, why don't we just have one for this morning, even though there could be many. Let's worship him. That is our application. If you trust in Jesus, it's because of his perfect will, his perfect work that he has done that you love him. You did not woo God. You did not do anything to like stir or cajole him to action. No, he loves you and has set his heart upon you because his heart is ultimately upon himself, his son who has died on your behalf. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. This is who our God is. By grace, through faith, we are saved. You did not earn God's love. You cannot have more of God's love. God is his love, and it is not stoked like a fire. It is set upon you in his perfect being. You worship a God who's entirely different. And so today, would you have your mind blown by the difference that is God's being? Would you worship God rightly? Would you have such a blessed Lord's Day reflecting on the fact that God is perfectly for himself and therefore you who rest in him are perfectly held by his power? To lead us into worship, I'm going to read the Westminster Confession on who God is. It is a beautiful way to properly, as humans, stoke our passions so that we would worship the one who has no passions This is what the Westminster Confession says of our God. I'm going to read it, and then we're going to worship together. It says, There is but one only living and true God, who is infinite in being and perfection, a most pure spirit, invisible, without body, parts, or passions, immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, most wise, most holy, most free, most absolute, working all things according to the counsel of his own immutable and most righteous will for his own glory, most loving, gracious, merciful, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, transgression and sin, the rewarder of them that diligently seek him, and withal most just and terrible in all his judgments, hating all sin, and who will by no means clear the guilty. This is your God. Church, would you stand and worship him?